Hello, Phil Croshaw here again from Passions. And in this episode, we're actually off to Uganda to talk to Dr. Gladys. Enjoy. Hello and a very warm welcome to this edition of Passions and today I'm delighted to say this this uh, Passions episode has an international flavour and uh, I'm actually talking to Dr Gladys Kalima Zikusika and I probably got that totally wrong and I apologise profusely. Uh, Dr Gladys will be able to tell you exactly who she is and how to pronounce her name properly uh, and uh, Dr Gladys is joining me today from Uganda so a very warm welcome to Passions, Dr. Gladys. Thank you so much for inviting me to the programme. Brilliant. OK, so let's just start off by telling everybody a bit about who you are and what it is you do and your passions. I'm a wildlife veterinarian and conservationist. I've been working with uh, mountain gorillas for 25 years now, and my passion is working with animals, and especially gorillas and all other wildlife. Fantastic. So how did that come about then? Was it, was it something that you were, shall we say, born with? Did you kind of be, were you born and then suddenly animals became a big thing for you? Or did that develop over time? I was born as the last born in a family of six and the sister who my sibling who I followed, my older sister was five and a half years older than me. So just outside my age bracket for playing. And my older brother who was 10 years older than me used to bring lots of pets home, stray cats and dogs. So they became my friends and I grew up um, playing with the pets. I wouldn't go to school if they're sick. I'd make sure I go with my mother to the vet. And then one day, uh, we got a new next door neighbor, the Cuban ambassador, and he decided to go and acquire a pet monkey, a pet velvet monkey. These days, you don't, it's not allowed, but in those days it was. And this pet velvet monkey, he, they called him Poncho. And he used to like to come over to our home uh, because our Cuban neighbors didn't have children. So I think he liked our home because we had lots of cats and dogs and there was a, probably someone to play with. I was a child. Maybe I was around eight years old. So he used to come over, pull the cats and dogs' tails, pick fruit from the kitchen. And one time I was one time I was playing the piano, and then I felt like I was being watched. And I looked over my shoulder and Poncho was watching me. So I moved out of the room to see what he's going what he would do. He sat down on the stool and played a note. And I got so excited and I rushed in. And of course he ran back home. But I think he introduced me to the, the world of primates. I realized that primates are so similar to human beings. His fingers, his nails, everything was so similar to mine. And I was really fascinated by that. And I think that was the first time I really thought about you know, relating to primates, I would say. And then later on, I got a chance to work with chimpanzees at the local zoo, Entebbe Zoo, which is now called the Uganda Wildlife Education Center. And they were orphan chimps and they were always escaping from the cages. And those days the cages weren't so sturdy and I used to bring them back and they were just so adorable. And then later on, I got to work with chimps in the wild under Professor Vernon Reynolds, who started the Budongo Forest Project. And then two years later, I got to work with the mountain gorillas. And how did I get to hear about the mountain gorillas? In um, my high school, in Uganda, I got an opportunity to revive the wildlife club. And that was a life-changing experience for me because I got so into it, we had debates. Um, we took the students to the national park, Queen Elizabeth National Park. And at the end of that experience where I was heading it as a chairperson, I felt like I wanted to become a vet who also works with wildlife. And having decided to, that I want to be a vet when I, well, we had all the cats and dogs at home, and I felt like I want to be a vet who could potentially work with wildlife. So, but during that time when I go to the offices, they would tell me about the mountain gorillas. 
and I got fascinated when I heard about them. But they said to me that they're not habituated for tourism and nobody can go and visit them or see them. However, but during my vet studies, they became habituated for tourism and I eventually got to study them, which was an amazing experience. And after I spent a whole month there, I felt that I only wanted to, I, I, went, I felt like I wanted to become a full-time wildlife vet as soon as I graduated from vet college. But I did my vet school at the Royal Vet College, University of London. And the great thing about that is they could allow you to work with an animal of your choice. And in the holidays, you had to do a lot of work in the holidays, but they said you could select an animal of your choice for some of the weeks that you have to see practice. And so that's when I got a chance whenever I'd come back home on holiday to work with the chimps in the zoo, the chimps in the wild and the gorillas in the wild. And that was really shaped my, shaped my career path significantly. <laughs> Absolutely. And wonderful. I ended up becoming the first vet for the Uganda National Parks, which eventually became the Uganda Wildlife Authority. <laughs> wonderful. And, and then more recently then, you've, you, I think you set up, didn't you, the CEO, and you set up the um, conservation through public health, I think it's called, isn't it? We started CTPH, Conservation Through Public Health, based on experiences I had working in Uganda as the first wildlife vet for the Uganda, for Uganda. And one of the very first cases I had to handle was a skin disease outbreak, scabies skin disease outbreak, which was eventually traced to people living around the park who have very little health care. Although I was hired in that position as a first vet when guerrilla tourism had just begun and they were concerned that people traveling from around the world could come and make the gorilla sick, you know, with a flu or something like that, much like COVID-19 or something like that. They felt that um, it was important to have a vet to make sure the gorillas are fine. But the very first human beings, the set of human beings that made the gorilla sick were not tourists, it was a local community. Because Windy National Park is bordering, it's like a very small park and it's only 330 square kilometers. And there's a very hard edge between the community and the park. So when it was a forest reserve, people used to cut trees. When it became a national park, you could not cut trees anymore. But that means there's no buffer zone around the park and gorillas still come out because once they lose their fear of people, they go back to where they used to be. And in order to have tourists visiting them, and researchers, you have to habituate them to the point that they lose their fear of people. And we realized that that was a big problem at Windy. And what happens is the gorillas go out and maybe they're eating people's banana plants and people are always putting out scarecrows to chase away gorillas, baboons and other wildlife. And we think that that's how they got the scabies. So when they called me and said that the gorillas are losing hair and developing white scaly skin, I actually spoke to a human doctor friend of mine who had studied in the UK Dr. Catherine Sozi, and she did her medical school there and she's had a practice in Uganda. And I asked her, what is the most common skin disease in people? And she said, it's scabies. So I took the drug with me that treats scabies because it's a 10 hour drive uh, from the capital city. And we were really relieved that it was scabies and not ringworm because with ringworm, you have to put on ointment every single day or give a treatment where you have to, it's a very long treatment you have to give a lot of treatment for ringworm to get better. Whereas with scabies, mm. one shot of ivermectin was enough, you know, for them to get better, one injection. So luckily it ended up being scabies. And because of all these experiences, and when we had a health education workshop with the local community four years later, where they all felt that me being the only vet in the organization who has some level of public health training, I should be the one to lead this effort. And that was another turning point in my life because, <laughs> I designed brochures of human, how to prevent disease transmission between people and humans in the local languages. And we went together with a community conservation warden and ranger who normally talk to the community about the benefits of the park and why we should protect it and the revenue that could be shared from tourism. And then we also went with the district health people who talk to people about their health and their welfare, you know, their well-being. So we, it was a great group to move with because we had different kinds of expertise. And during that time, I actually told them, this is the problem. You know, people get too close to gorillas. The gorillas came in and they touched dirty clothing and that's how they got sick. And then they said to me, then I was like, now this is the solution. And the warden touched my hand and said, let's hear what they have to say. And they came out with much better 
ideas and suggestions that I had for them, much more varied. And this was a huge, it was my first time to really have an interaction with people in that way. And I learned so much from that experience and from everyone. And I felt that we can implement a lot of what they said in recommendations in an NGO. So we set up conservation through public health a couple of years later. And my husband, who we just got married, he was the first founder member of CTPH and somebody else who was a vet technician at the Ministry of Agriculture. So Lawrence Iksoka and Stephen Rubanga, the three of us, we set up conservation through public health in 2003 and uh, working closely with so many other partners. Because And we got uh, everybody welcomed the idea because they realized that the gorillas were really at risk from human disease and nobody was addressing improvement of community health around the national park. And so they all welcomed the gap that conservation through public health was filling. And yeah, it's been a long, it's been a very interesting journey, <laughs> but especially now during the COVID-19 pandemic, it's really, we're working very hard during this time. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. I must ask you about that because uh, obviously we're doing this interview mid-December when um, the world is 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 all on the same page for the, for once in a rare time in rare times um, with the challenges of the pandemic. And as I'm sure you're aware, we we've got our many challenges here in the UK um, still. Um, mm -hmm. What's been the impact then of, of COVID-19 on uh, where you are and the, the, um, the NGO and the situation? What, what's, what's been the impact? The impact on COVID-19, we've been much luckier than you in the UK. We've had very few cases comparatively. Um, mm. But however, we, we've suddenly had a surge in cases over the past month. And, you know, we've had a doubling in new cases within one month. And when that starts to happen, you know, you you know, I'm sure you you went through it a lot earlier in March, and we're going through that kind of pattern right now. So it's a bit scary yes. for everyone. Um, but we currently have about twenty. As of yesterday, there were about twenty-eight thousand cases, and uh, about two hundred and thirty deaths from COVID nineteen. And so it's, it, is a, it is a bit of a, a worry for everybody. And, but when the pandemic began, our government was very, 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 very proactive. I mean, schools were shut down before even the first case happened in Uganda. And so by the time the first case came, there was already a lockdown. And so the spread was really, really minimized at the beginning, which is helping right now <laughs> during this second surge. The spread was sure. really minimized. But one thing that we did do is we were, because people were getting too close to gorillas, you know, you're only supposed to be five meters, seven meters away from the gorillas and tourists were getting too close. I did a study with students in Ohio University and they found that in America and they found that in spite of the rangers telling the tourists when you're having the briefing that you shouldn't get closer than seven meters when you visit the gorillas, 60% of the time the tourists go too close. And 40% of the time, it was the gorillas who broke the rules because the gorillas are so used to seeing people, they're very naturally curious and they get too close. And so every so it was like 98% of the time, people were getting too close to each other. People and gorillas were getting too close to each other. And so something had to be done about this. And uh, the Uganda Wildlife Authority asked us to train the park staff to upgrade the regulations. So everybody now has to wear a mask when you visit the gorillas. This was as early as March when people are just beginning to realize that wearing masks is useful in Uganda, especially. So people are now, you know, at that time we, people started to wear double layered face masks or, you know, surgical masks or N95. And then at the same time, the distance was increased from seven to 10 meters. And if you if you have cough or flu, you're obviously not allowed to go up from before, but this time around your temperature is also taken to catch any subclinical infection. And this was also because the very first case of COVID in Uganda was not some, the person didn't have cough or flu. Because the government was really looking, really trying hard to detect the first person. And was someone a returning Ugandan coming back from Dubai who had a high temperature of 38 degrees C. And when they tested him, he was positive. And it's like, whoa, we've got COVID in Uganda. It was a huge, big thing. 
poor guy was being examined and then the next day they said oh and he's developed red eyes and he was like a specimen <laughs> 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 and by this time poor you devil. guys already had four cases but it was like whoa the first case for you know he was really he was in on the media poor guy i mean but now you know we have so many more cases yeah. but at the time and, and are, the, something are, the, are, the, are the gorillas <laughs> are the gorillas at any kind of risk from covid then doctor Yes, the gorillas are at risk from COVID because wow. we share over 98% genetic material and we can easily make each other sick. And just as they picked up scabies from people and they picked up other respiratory diseases from people, um, which is part of the common flu, like uh, human metanemovirus infection, respiratory syncytiovirus infection, all of those are part of the common flus. And also coronaviruses are part of the common flu. There's some coronaviruses that are not as as contagious as SARS-CoV-2. This is a new strain of coronavirus, but yeah. all of those are part of the common flu. And, um, but gorillas have ever got human metanemovirus and respiratory syncytiovirus. And chimpanzees have also ever got them as that as well. And chimpanzees in Ivory Coast have ever had a mild form of coronavirus, which happened oh, right. in 2016. Really? Yes, they got it and it, they, they only had mild symptoms, but it likely came from the local community in the area. So we know that the chimpanzees and gorillas are highly susceptible to respiratory diseases, um, what you call the human influenza viruses, okay, human respiratory viruses, they're highly susceptible to them. And also research has come out recently showing that people, great apes like gorillas and chimps and orangutans and old, other old world primates like the monkeys and the baboons found in Africa have the same protein receptors that the virus likes to attach to, the SARS-CoV-2 virus attaches to. They're called ECT protein receptors. They found that they're exactly the same, which means the way that we get affected by COVID, they could get affected. And you know, COVID in people can either be, you can either be asymptomatic or you have mild symptoms or you have very severe symptoms and mm -hmm. you die. And the same thing can happen. We can Im would imagine would happen to the gorillas. They may have a combination of, of symptoms based on their inbuilt immunity, you know, and other things like that. So the only, also the most difficult thing for them is it's much easier to treat human beings than it is to treat wild animals in the wild that are completely wild. You know, you can't give them that same level of intensive care that you would give to a human being. And so the best thing to do is to prevent it getting into the gorillas by carrying out, you know, really enforcing the rules where people have to wear masks, people have to, if they're coming anywhere within 10 meters of a gorilla, including the people who herd the gorillas back when they come out of the park. We call them gorilla guardians or human gorilla conflict resolution teams. We've also trained them. Since the pandemic began, we've trained rangers. We also trained them recently last month again. We had trained the human gorilla conflict team or gorilla guardians. We've also trained a group of volunteers who go to people's homes to talk to them about being healthy and hygienic. And, and not to enter the park to poach and collect firewood. We also, all those guys have also received a lot of training. Um, and I'm pleased to say that the hand washing facilities have gone up at all the homes because people are scared of getting COVID from each other. And if a gorilla comes into someone's garden, the gorilla guardians are called out to herd them back and we get them all masks. So they, they herd them back when they're wearing masks and they try and minimize the distance between them and the gorillas. So we're trying our best to train all kinds of different people who would likely interact with the gorillas to interact with them in a safe way. And this includes the tourists. Absolutely. It seems as if it's a constant battle. You know, you've got all the challenges of um, things like poachers and that kind of thing, which which is probably relatively well known as, a, as an issue. And you've also yeah. then got, if that isn't enough, then you've got the disease kicking in or diseases and kicking in um mm -hmm. what's the general prognosis then for the future of the gorillas at the moment as we speak at the moment in end of 2020 is their survival looking relatively assured or is it constant a constant battle ongoing battle and will be for the years to come I would say that the future of the gorillas, their survival is relatively assured as long as the people who they share habitat with, which is the local communities, are healthy and their well-being and livelihoods is catered for. Because 
they need to be healthy because they'll come into interaction with the gorillas and we don't want them to make them sick. But the only way that their well-being and livelihoods can be uplifted and attended to is by is through tourism, actually. Um, that's the most sustainable way. And so basically we still need tourists to come. And well, money that they pay, some of it goes to run the, the Wildlife Authority and not only that National Park actually, but others. Um, which are not earning enough money because they just don't have such charismatic species, but they have very important species to protect. But also what's really important is that some money shared with the local communities. So 20% of the park entry fee and $10 from every gorilla permit goes to the surrounding community. And then also 90% of the staff employed in the wildlife in the windy park are from the local community. And just by giving one person a job, you're helping five other people, you know, to have to be able to have, you know, to, to, to have their needs met, their family needs met. And at the same time, people uh, have a lot of businesses, you know, some of them are porters, they take tourist bags to the gorillas and they get paid quite a lot compared to the rest of the community. Then you have some who make crafts, which they sell to tourists and tablecloths and some sell coffee, like our farmers, gorilla conservation coffee, uh, the farmers who we've engaged around the park, others, sell walks, other sell accommodation, food, so all kinds of things. So that the ecotourism industry is very vibrant around Windy because the local communities are really involved and engaged. And as and because of that, they see the gorillas are their future and they'll do anything to protect them. So even if a gorilla goes to their garden, they won't kill it. They'll call out the gorilla guardians or the park rangers to come and you know make sure the gorillas are herded in the best way. And so that in itself makes it that the gorillas have a secure future. And that, that however, so we have to make sure, sorry. Yes, however, we have to make sure that health does not compromise all of this. So the people who come and bring money that gives the local community an economic incentive to tolerate the gorillas and coexist with them have to be healthy. We have to minimize them making the gorillas sick. That's one very important part. Then also at the same time, the people have to, the way that the only way you can reduce poaching and all of those things is if they're earning enough from tourism, then they won't feel compelled to enter the park to poach. Because when they do, they set snares for, not actually in that part of Uganda, people don't eat gorillas, they don't eat primates. Um, that part of Africa where we are, thankfully, but they set snares for other species in the forest that they like to eat, such as the bush pigs and the daika, which is a small antelope and people like to eat them. And then when they set snares, gorillas accidentally get caught in snares, or if they, if these animals come, or sometimes they spear them, which is what sadly what happened in June, a bush pig, someone came to, he speared a bush pig, and because the gorilla, he, he, the bush pig screamed when it was being speared, the gorilla got scared and thought they're attacking his family, and he charged. And gorillas are very gentle. It's normally just a mock charge, but then the poacher got scared and speared him. And that was big because the group split up. Um, some of them left and went to another group. They were very unsettled. And it was so sad because the community is benefiting so much from tourism, as I've mentioned. So many of the community members were very upset with this poacher, very, very upset with him. But at the same time, some of the local leaders told us that this, he's among the poorest of the poor. And that, I realized that that was probably part of the reason they were being driven into the park to poach during this time, because when the local economy is down, everybody suffers in one way or another. And so he was hungry and he, he, he took a chance. He thought, oh, they're not probably not patrolling the park as much because they're no tourists. And he went in to get food for his family and also to sell on the local market so that he could have some money for his family. And so, yeah, so that's kind of what happened. and. That's why it's a very delicate balance between health and economics, just like it is all over the world right now, with COVID-19. <laughs> yeah, but I, especially, I mean, that's fascinating because it, it really is a, it must be a challenge and it's quite a quandary, isn't it? Where you've got the people who need to eat and need to feed their families, which is a, a natural human instinct that we all have yes. versus the needs of keeping the species alive and well. And I suppose sometimes the two, the two issues clash. Yes, they do. Yeah, yeah, I can see I can see that being I can see that being quite a challenge. Um, brilliant. Okay, well, um, 
it's very your passion for this is very very clear to see um has your passion for this and for the the primates um has that helped you to um do the learning and the uh, education that's needed in order to be the expert that you are and does that keep on growing because there's always something new to learn isn't there yes you stated it just right <laughs> because when i first started working with gorillas i was fresh out of vet school Royal Vet College, University of London. And I mainly focused on learning about cats and dogs, um, you know, people's pets, horses, cows, goats, sheep, pigs. It, it was all domestic animals. And suddenly I was given this big job, um, which actually what happened is I did, you know, when that opportunity came up, basically I did my, my uh, when I did my research that, that time looking at, parasites and bacteria and the dung of the gorillas when there were only two gorilla groups and tourism had just begun. It was a great place to be at because although I was mainly focusing on the health of the gorillas, I was happy to be at the tourist site. And I saw what tourism was bringing so much hope to this very poor community in Uganda at the edge of Uganda and DRC. And I, there was such an air of hope. And I got to speak to the tourists. They loved to hear the stories I had to say. We had to say about the work I was doing we're doing with the gorillas. We got a, a lot of free dinners and lunches because they wanted to hear what we had to say, which is great because we had to cook for ourselves as, stu as a student. I had to cook for myself. And I was there with the Peace Corps volunteers. And it was just amazing being in a tourism site because I got to understand all the aspects of conservation that actually tourism can really support conservation efforts if it's done in the right way. So it was a great place for me to be at. And then I wrote to the director of Uganda National Parks Professor Eric Droma, and I, I said to him, you, you need a vet, and this is what a vet does. And then I shared with him my, the report that I wrote about my the month I spent at Windy. And he, I was so surprised when he wrote back to me and said, your job is waiting for you. I'm like, whoa, you know? <laughs> he said, we are looking for a vet for, for the gorillas and other animals, so. And so I, then I said to him, then I got cold feet, because I said, um, I think I need to do a master's or something because I'm just, I haven't yet even graduated from vet school and I haven't really had much experience with wildlife. And he's like, okay. And then, but the, but the place where I wanted to do the master's at London Zoo, it was a master's in wildlife medicine. At, at, it was a new MSc. And my professor at Royal Vet College who helped me in the study of the parasites was part of the co-professors for this course. They needed, we needed to pay money and the Kulika Charitable Trust, which sponsored my vet education in the UK, said to me, we don't typically sponsor stuff continuously. You have to go back and work, do some work for a couple of years, then come back to us and then we'll be happy to sponsor your masters. Because they said they don't, they prefer, they always find that if somebody works first, they are much better. They choose, they select the best masters that fits them and they're much, they benefit a lot more from the masters because they've actually put what they've learned into practice. And that was the best yeah. advice I could ever get. Yeah, so I kind of wrote back to him and I said, you know what, I've not been able to get the scholarship for the masters, but can I still come? And he said, yeah, sure. So I turned up <laughs> to Bwindi and luckily Dr. Liz McPhee, who was working for International Gorilla Conservation Program and previous to that had worked with Mountain Gorilla Vet Project, which was a veterinary project that was set up to help the gorillas in Rwanda when the late Dr. Diane Fossey said, gorillas are getting caught in snares, can I have veterinarians? So it was started like in the eighties and she had worked with them. So she, she was a vet doctor by training and had all the experience, but now she was working as a senior conservation leader, setting up a new NGO in a new country. And she had written to me when I was at vet school saying, you know, telling me about her work. And I said, I wanted to come and work with her. So I, she gave me, she looked after me when I did the master's, when I did the research as a vet student, the undergraduate research. So it was very good to have her there because even before I started the job, there was a gorilla with a snare in Rwanda and the Rwandan, the vet who was based in Rwanda had gone home on holiday. It was an American vet, Dr. Jonathan Sleeman. So she said, well, this was just before Christmas, two days to Christmas. She's like, I've just got a call that there's a gorilla with a snare in Rwanda. And do you want to come along? I'm like, yeah, sure. Oh, this is, I have to start learning now on the job because I've got this job and I've never ever had to, 
handle a, sick, a gorilla in the intervention. So we went over to Rwanda and I have a very, very protective mother. Um, she allows me to do what I want. And she was a bit concerned about me working with the gorillas because she thought they were going to mow me because <laughs> unfortunately gorillas have a bad rep with King Kong movies and stuff like that. She was really, really scared <laughs> being her last born. But, um, but then I, she knows I like animals. So she's always encouraged my love for animals, but she was a little, when it came to the gorillas, she was really, really scared. And then I said, I'll be fine. I'll be fine. And everybody tried to reassure her. So did Dr. Liz McPhee. And I went to Gwindi and I came out alive. She was okay about that. And so this time around, I said, I'm going to Rwanda to treat a gorilla. And she's like, you have to be back by Christmas. That's the condition. So we, I got onto the bus and Liz met me at the border and we went and that was my first intervention. We did it together with her and the Randy's vet, Dr. Tony with Kikwa, very dynamic vet as well. And then as soon as we did the intervention and released the gorilla from the snare, I had to, Liz had to put me back on the bus and I had to get back and spend Christmas at home. So, and then immediately a, few, a couple of weeks later, I started my first job. And within nine months of the job, we had the scabies outbreak in the gorillas. And so, and actually Liz used to tease me and say, it's, it's a, with wildlife vet medicine at the time, it's got better now that there are more wildlife vets. But at the time, all over the world, there were not many wildlife vets. And she said, it's more like you see one, do one and teach one type. <laughs> She had been Wonderful. through the same kind of learning on the job. Yeah, so, you know, yeah. I saw the snare remover in Rwanda. Next thing I had to do with the gorilla myself, you know, and then Wonderful. next thing you're, you're teaching somebody else to do it, you know, it's a bit like that. But it's our passion oh. that enables us to, to really, you know, what do you call it, stretch and really put and try and see what else we can learn. And I also learned a lot from vets in Kenya. So, we got to meet to move giraffes and elephants, translocate giraffes and elephants for the first time. And I did it with other vets and I learned from them. I called them to Uganda. We translocated elephants. Then I learned how to translocate. For example, we went to, we captured, uh, we translocated elephants in Kenya. And I went for training at Kenya Wildlife Service. And the reason I went for that training is because the Dr. Droma, who was the executive director of wildlife authority said to me now we have a vet you know this he said to us that there were two elephants that were destroying people's crops in an area where they could never they were really stuck in a small forest and it was on the migration route between two national parks murchison falls and queen elizabeth which was one of the first two national parks in the country but because of people building up and high human population growth and urbanization there were only two elephants remaining because some of them had been poisoned by the local communities because they were tired of them raiding their banana plants. And so he said to me, elephants have destroyed somebody's crops. I want you to go out there. So I went there with the legal officer, which is also a young, we're about the same age. And we saw the damage the elephants had done. So we said to the farmer, we're gonna try our best to see what we can do. And Dr. Droma said, now we have a vet. Instead of shooting these elephants um, or scaring them away, let's move them. He was just amazing. And I'm like going to him, it's not that easy to move an elephant, but I'll see what I can do about it. So, <laughs> so we contacted Kenya Wildlife Service and uh, Clem Kotsia, who was, who was an animal capture expert from Zimbabwe and had even taught a lot of, he helped Kenya and taught a lot of wildlife vets to do animal capture all over the world. He came over and we moved those two, those two elephants. And I first went for training in Kenya to see how it all works. And then we worked with him and a German warden called Peter Muller. It was all of us, it was our first time to do this in Uganda. But because we're all so passionate about helping these animals, we did it and everybody was so excited. And so the elephants were taken to Queen Elizabeth National Park. And then the next thing was we needed to move giraffes from Kenya to Uganda. And I worked with the Kenya Wildlife Service vets in capturing the giraffes. But then when it came to flying them to Uganda, the head vet said, I don't have my passport. I don't know if he did that deliberately. But I was suddenly on my own, having to move with these giraffes to Uganda. We flew them in a military Hercules plane. They had to stand up. They were baby giraffes. And I had to like basically be the only vet. I came from being surrounded by four experienced vets who were more experienced than me to being the only vet handling this in the journey all the way and as like So it was a lot of that learning on the job. But it was so exciting. Do you know the, 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 the giraffes we brought? 
the giraffes we brought, the three giraffes we brought, the numbers went from five, went from eight, five giraffes to 35. So we're really excited about that. The numbers actually really went up just from translocating three animals. Now there's over, there's close to 50 animals in Kidep National Park because of that translocation. And so we're very excited about that. Just a simple activity, if it's done in the right way, can make a huge difference for wildlife. There's, there's, there's so much insight there and so many stories there. I'm, I'm just conscious of time, so and I know it's getting late there, even later than it is here. Um, finally then, um, there's probably a lot of people, a lot of young people actually, who love animals, who know they have a love of animals. Is there any... Yes advice that you could give and i know that there's probably lots of advice but in kind of summary what sort of advice might you give to somebody who is young and loves animals in order to make a career out of that passion what sort of things should they be thinking about and what sort of attitude do they need to have to actually make that come come true like you have um, let me see. I think the advice I'd give to young people is to really follow their dreams and the rest will follow. And working with animals is very fulfilling and it's very rewarding. For me, when I, when I relieve an animal from suffering, if, if I've been treating an animal and it gets better, I'm very happy. If a species that we're working with starts to bounce back, like the mountain gorillas are now, you know, their number, they now have, a, their numbers are growing. Whereas before they used to, they were going down, they're now endangered and no longer critically endangered. I get very inspired. So working with animals can be challenging, but it's very rewarding when you, when you can make a difference. And also there's not that many opportunities, at least definitely in Uganda and all around the world, there are not that many opportunities to work with animals and especially wild animals. And so for somebody who wants to work with wild animals, they really have to, sometimes they have to create their opportunities like I did when I wrote to the head of the Uganda National Parks and said, you know, you yes. need a vet and this is what a vet does. Can you give me that job um, to be your first vet? Sometimes you have to create those opportunities and it's very important to get, you know, learn from other people, see practice with people, um, spend time, you know, working with people from a young age, you know, whether it's, you know, for example, if you like with wildlife, you know, clubs, setting up the wildlife club gave me a very good insight into wildlife conservation issues. And so if you're interested in animals, try your best to get experience working with them, even before you get to university. So that it gives you a clear idea of which direction you want to take, whether it's going to be with domestic animals, farm animals, you know, pet animals, farm animals, horses, wild animals in a zoo, wild animals in the wild. It's quite good to just try and give yourself a varied experience as much as possible. And yeah, but it's really, really amazing. And one thing I can say, the animals, um, working with animals is not, they don't tell, first of all, one thing about it, which always amused my relatives is, they said, why don't you want just be a regular human doctor? I said, because I don't like seeing animals suffering. And then they, because the degree is the same, you know, that the studies you do to become a human doctor is the same as an animal doctor. It's the same thing you do in A-levels right. and everything. The same yeah. science subjects, biology, physics, chemistry. It's, it's a, a lot of that is the same. But I said, you know, animals don't lie, but people do. So they found that very amusing. <laughs> <laughs> and it's very hard to argue with, it, with that. Absolutely. Wonderful. Well, honestly, Dr. Gladys, thanks ever so much for joining me today. Uh, it was really interesting. Some really interesting insight there. Uh, I must get you on again at some time because I'm, I'm really, really interested to explore some of the entrepreneurial and enterprise things that you, you touched on. You know, that whole thing about having to be entrepreneurial and enterprising in order to bring the money in uh, rather than just relying yes. on charities and relying on governments and such like so there must be a very significant part of your role and part of the role that you do with with the other people which is to come up with those entrepreneurial ideas that can sustain yes. it all and keep it going <laughs> and actually yes it is no i'd love to I actually became an ashoka fellow for leading social entrepreneurs for combining uganda's wildlife management and rural public health programs to create common resources for people and animals, common benefits for people and animals, and they support social entrepreneurs. 
like oh, you know, sort of, well do, do you know we, we really <laughs> with your agreement of course um i'd love to get you back on and just talk about that because i think it's another angle and, and and very interesting so finally then and actually um, one thing one, yes. one thing i'd like to mention mention Please as well do. is that um we the wildlife authority has given us permission to record a video um somebody's going to record a video he's a musician who created a song for the gorilla that was killed um for a fiki and it's a really lovely song and um i'd love to share it with you and you could play it on the show but it's really really nice song it's available on amazon spotify and all these international channels tidal as well and it's it's she's talking about rafiki the gorilla and how gorillas are so similar to us and how we should protect them he's a ugandan artist so that should be very nice nice one when it comes out i mean the song uh, is done but not going to come out as well so finally then um it, it, there's a general perspective that says that uh, if you're able to make a living from something that you're really passionate about, it doesn't really feel like work. Is that something you would buy into? Is that something you agree with or not? I definitely agree with that. <laughs> you know, I, I really feel I'm so lucky, you know, I, the best part of my job is when I'm with the animals. And, but of course, being a an, an leader of an NGO, a charity, I have to do admin, which I really don't like. And um, I don't mind the fundraising too much. I, I don't mind meeting donors. And I like that part, because especially if the donors are passionate about what we're doing. But when I'm with the animals, I just love it. And I think, wow, I'm actually earning a living from doing what I love doing. Yes, so it doesn't feel like work. <laughs> it doesn't, I don't and think I'll I'll I've ever had a holiday, actually. I'll let you into <laughs> the as well. I'll let you into a secret as well. I hate the admin and bureaucracy just as much. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't think I've had a holiday, holiday since I started, you know. Yeah, <laughs> 17 the years I remember, the there's two things I remember <laughs> about this interview, actually. Uh, one is that a, a very useful reminder that animals don't lie, humans do. And uh, the <laughs> fact that uh, your mum was really worried that you were going to get attacked by a kind of a, a 60 foot high gorilla called King Kong. That's the other thing I'll yes. remember. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks ever so much, yes. uh, Dr. Glass. And you know, really she eventually came and saw them. She, she eventually came and saw the gorillas. She eventually came and saw them. Um, maybe, let me see. She, she came and saw them a few years after I started working with them. And she said, Oh, they're just gentle vegetarian giants. Yeah. <laughs> she liked them. Very relieved. <laughs> I would imagine she was very yes. relieved at that point. She could stop worrying about you so much. She was. <laughs> <laughs> right. Thanks, Dr. Gladys. Uh, have a lovely evening and thank you very much indeed for joining me. I really appreciate it. And I'm looking forward to having you on again at some point next year uh, to talk a little bit more about the enterprise side. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you so much for inviting me and um, we look forward to host you in Uganda one day, take you to see the amazing gorillas and see the work we're doing with the communities to help to conserve them. <laughs> oh, that, that would be absolutely wonderful. I'll, I'll have a word with Spencer Phillips and I'll tell him that you've invited us. <laughs> so yes, um, definitely. what we need to do is get rid, of that, get rid of that pesky virus and then we can get back to some kind of normality. <laughs> Exactly. Maybe go for your vaccine and all, so many other things that need to happen to bring the pandemic under control. Yes. But yeah. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thank you very and much. And healthy. Thank you. Take care and be safe. Thanks. Bye bye. Bye bye. Merry Christmas. Mm -hmm. Merry Christmas to you too.